here on Lee Chess and Twitch. I'm William Pascal. I'm an international master from the United States based in Hungary, Europe, world. Um, we're going to be playing challenges between five and eight minutes today. So ranging between blitz and classical chess, anything from five plus three up to eight plus three. If you guys want to challenge any of the above time controls, five plus three, five plus five, six plus five, seven plus three, seven plus five, eight plus three is the maximum I'm going to play. That's the longest game available for today. We've got challenges from Amir, Baku's Constant Change. Thought we had one more. Maybe we lost somebody. Just wait a minute till we get running here on on Twitch and, and Lee Chess. Just a minute. Our stream should be posted on Lee Chess. Let me make sure title is good. Got .org in the Lee Chess .org in the title. So guys, I'm streaming every every weekday morning here, CET Central European time between 10 and 12:30. Yesterday we did our 15 plus 2 long classical stream, which unfortunately I'd like to be longer because you only get to play like six games during that stream. We had a couple of interesting games, Constant Change, one of them, Karo Khan. All right guys, let's get started. Amir 1991. I just want to mention before we start, um, you guys can watch uh, the uploads, the videos of the uh, streams on YouTube. My channel on YouTube is Video Chess Training on YouTube. I upload all the, the streams up there along with uh, once a week or so, another supplemental video I'll often create for YouTube. So check it out, Video Chess Training on YouTube. Feel free to uh, comment in the comments section if you have any questions about the the stream or what was going on in the games. Let's get started. So Amir, we're white. Let's play c4 against him. I remember once he played a very interesting line with black <clears throat> against uh, my English opening. Maybe we'll play, well, let's play straight up, knight to c3. I mean, I often play g3 as well. I've experimented with knight f3. I don't really like it, to be honest. The Four Knights English, um, speaking of the YouTube channel, I do have a couple videos on this particular variation. Knight f3, knight c6, g3, bishop c5. Down the line, we're going to create more, you know, topical opening videos. I'm not personally necessarily an opening theoretician, but I have as much interest in the openings as anybody else, uh, my level or below. All right, so g3. I've been playing this opening since, uh, since the beginning of time, basically. My first repertoire with the white pieces featured primarily the English with white when I was getting my first rating back in the Stone Ages. Now, if I recall correctly, there might be an alternative to CD here, but we're not going to go there today. All right, so C takes D. Very fun variation I've seen before is like queen a4, but we're going to play the main line. Um, but he varied from the last time we played, because last time we played, Amir played a very interesting continuation, e4, which I had never seen. No, 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 wait a minute. Am I, am I lying here? e4, knight g5. Yeah, that's strange. He played e4, knight g5, and then d5. Okay, he played e4, knight g5, I think, and then d5. Some strange gambit, I, I, I can't recall exactly now, but um, now we're back into a normal, normal Sicilian reversed. Um, this is very standard. I think that black should probably equalize with best play, but that's probably true for all openings, so. Constant change, welcome to the chat room. We don't have any moderators at the moment, so let's keep the trolls at bay. Um, F6 immediately. This is a highly unusual move. Um, it looks like a blunder because his d5 knight is not protected. There's a veiled threat from the bishop on g2 in addition to pressure from the knight on c3. Typically, I'm playing the accelerated dragon in the Sicilian as black a lot, and this kind of tactic crops up all the time. So we have to calculate a little bit here. Knight takes e5. 
If he recaptures, we win a pawn, basically, by getting our piece back. But we play knight takes e5, he plays knight takes c3, then we play knight takes c6, knight takes d1, knight takes d8, knight takes f2, Then what is the magic question? Knight takes c5, knight takes c3, knight takes c6. Knight takes d1, knight takes d8. <coughs> knight takes f2. He's on my rook. Problem is he's on my rook there, and I guess I could play something along the lines of, well, what? Knight takes b7, knight takes h1, and I'm losing material. That's very strange. Knight takes e5, knight takes e3, knight takes c6. Knight takes d1. There's just no alternatives. Knight takes d8, knight takes f2, and uh, I'm not winning any material. I have to take back on f2. He takes back on d8. That final position, that ending, like his king might be slightly worse placed than mine, interfering with his rooks, but that's hardly enough reason for me to uh, to be convinced about this. So I really don't know what to do here. d4, bishop b4 is a problem. Very, very odd that this move order is playable for black. d4, bishop b4 doesn't work, does it? d takes e5, knight takes c3, queen takes d8. You might be able to get away with something like that. Queen takes d8, king takes d8. a3, bishop a5, it doesn't seem to work. Nothing seems to work here for white tactically. I don't understand how black can play f6 in this position so early with colors reversed. And there's no punishment, d4 doesn't work. Bishop b4 there. I was looking at d4, bishop b4, d takes e, knight takes c3, queen takes d8, and now king takes d8. a3, bishop a5, I have no good moves. I mean, b4 maybe in that position, <clears throat> but that doesn't seem really right. No, b4 doesn't work. There's nothing. All right, I have nothing better than to transpose back into some kind of... I wasted four minutes thinking about something that doesn't work. It's unbelievable. There doesn't seem to be any trick, and now I'm just transposed back into kind of standard position. Maybe d4 now. d4, knight takes, knight takes... Pawn takes knight b5. All right, let's try it. <clears throat> I may have to sacrifice a pawn here for the initiative. He just plays pawn takes pawn. And then knight b5 was my idea. There is this weakness here and this weakness here, and hopefully we can tie them together and at least get our pawn back while opening the position for our superior development. <clears throat> it's actually quite a quite a common kind of theme for for the black side of the uh, the dragon. So bishop f four. How does he protect c seven?
Looks like easily, right? He just plays knight d5. This is kind of a nightmare. I might have other moves like queen c2. My original plan was b4. I mean, it's interesting. Queen c2, queen e7. Bishop f4, knight d5 looks like a dead end. Though it's possible I have some kind of intermezzo. Just sack a pawn here. I don't know. Fifteen hundred in bullet. Doesn't seem like I have quite enough compensation. But I don't like this recapture by him. I mean, this capture. <coughs> I don't think he should give up his dark squared bishop for a knight, but he's also playing too fast in this position. Check. If I play e4 right away, black had c5 there. So I have to play this move first, followed by e4. But he's playing basically bullet chess in an 8 minute time control, which doesn't really make sense to me. But you can tell people over and over again, they never listen. Um, it's kind of a human nature. If they're not going to listen, they're not going to listen. It doesn't matter, you know, how many times you tell them. So we're down to 28 seconds, but with a three second increment, if I get a technically winning position, um, my technique is good enough usually to take it down. The first move I didn't like was bishop takes d4 for black. I don't see why he has to give that guy up, and uh, or girl, however. He, she, it. Um, I don't mean to be discriminatory. Oh, c6. All right. Take it, take it, take it. Take it, take it, take it. Let's keep it simple. Is that simple? Simple to me. Take it, take it, take it. We're just taking everything. Trading some pieces while we're at it. All right. Let's make a new queen. We're up a bishop. Five minutes less on the on the time, but uh, all right, dude. Do, do not trade pieces when you're when you're down material. Cardinal rule. And lady five. Let's go for that pawn. It's pretty easy to win, actually. Maybe stronger to play rook d5 there, <clears throat> actually. Even I start to panic lately when I when I get in a little bit of time pressure. Um, never used to do that, but thirty seconds with three second increment is basically all day. So this should be game over. Again, trading pieces. 
when we're up material makes life easy maybe lock this pawn down on a white square where I can protect it with my bishop and that'll be over quickly go pawn hunting he can probably hold that if I go there so we'll go rook c5 <coughs> Scoop both these pawns. Pawn on e4. We don't want to let him play e3, maybe mess up our pawn structure if it's not absolutely necessary. So Amir is finished here. But once again, he played a very, very interesting opening against my English opening. And this time, not a gambit, but um, a very unusual move with f6 that I couldn't come up with any refutation for. Just a spot. You guys have the time change there, and um, it must be really, really late for you. Of course, Justice Spot is on the west coast, so... Move the clocks ahead an hour. Here in Europe, we don't change time until uh, another week and a half. Two weeks behind the U.S. in terms of time changing. Spinal Tap is here too. There they are, man. The legends. We should see a match between those two sometime. Strategy Master against against Tactics Master. <laughs> I don't know which one's which. All right. I'm just kidding. They're not that one-dimensional. These guys are both professional, highly trained professionals. All right, my messages. If you guys want to contact me while I'm doing the stream, send me a message in the Twitch chat. And uh, how'd the stream go? Spinal, spinal streaming. Oh my God. Spinal tapped streaming. Wow, that's crazy. Baku's constant change. Haggard DK. What's up, Spinal Tap? Do you uh, do you get to play anymore? Over the board tournaments much? What about you, uh, Justice Bot? Still in Oregon? D4, Knight F6. There's nothing really to talk about in the chess world. It seems like um, I noticed there's a St. Louis a St. Louis International going on, but it didn't look really interesting to me. Oh no, the Bishop F4 London system, the accelerated London system. All right, let's take a look at this. I saw some interesting lines, you know, with, with C5 right away. And uh, this is probably critical. Now, if you play Queen B6, I had this Russian IM I played. He was really well prepared. He did like Knight A3 or something. I actually saw some games with knight c3 and knight a3 if you try to play queen b6 here and I thought I was smart and it was like equalizing but it's actually this line may not be that clear um, possible that white's slightly better so I am um, I'm not gonna make that mistake of trying to punish this thing outright you know with this early queen b6 e3 is a good move order for white you know if he plays a quiet line like c3 or something of that ilk, um, then queen b6 is probably good. But if they can go knight c3 or knight a3 with tricks based on knight b5 and trapping your queen on b2, it can get pretty hairy. So I'm going to avoid that. And um, let's see. Well, I can always play cd. I've definitely played games with that. I'm not overly thrilled about it, though. You can always play g6. But g6, you know, technically he can do what Jinji used to do all the time, which is like turn it into a c4 type opening. Although, not here, right? I can play for d5 maybe. If I play g6, knight f3, bishop g7, but eventually white will have like c4, won't he? But how can he do that, actually? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's nothing wrong with g6. Just online chess and teaching, I may go back, may not go back to tournaments for a while outside of some local ones. Unfortunately, I'd like to play more too. Um, I am going to play 
I am going to play a GM tournament April 1st, guys. So this will be my first closed tournament in a long time here in Budapest. And I wish me luck. But I'm not going to be able to play as much as I would like. I'd like to play every month, you know, but we do have responsibilities. Teaching chess and whatnot and, and doing a stream here. So I can only afford a, a tournament vacation every few months, basically. So I hear what Justice Bot is saying. Luckily, um, you know, we uh, we have occasional strong tournaments here in Hungary. So <clears throat> I don't have to travel that far in this case, just in my own city. Um, so we'll be taking like 10 days off from the stream the first week of of April, basically. And taking this really seriously. All right, Queen C2. This is almost never a good move. In, uh, in the London system or any of these closed queen pawn type setups with this pawn triangle, um, I, I don't, I don't like nice, nice arrows. Thank you. Um, I don't like queen c2 almost ever. Although it is better than playing b3, I, I will admit, like you just never want to play b3 in this kind of position. Um, that's always bad. Queen c2, the main move is probably queen b3, um, and possibly you can try queen c1. Queen c2, it's a little more exposed. It's playable, not not the best square, probably. But anyway, maybe there's nothing I can really do to exploit it. Um, he played quickly knight b2 now. He's threatening knight c4. That is kind of discouraging. Um, I guess I'll have to play d6 to allow for queen c7. It's not my favorite diagonal but um, should be okay. Kind of an unusual setup. Actually, Baku's, I have a strange sensation that um, <clears throat> against you maybe, or somebody recently had a similar game with the knight on c4 very early, which is definitely non-standard. I mean, putting this guy here, it's kind of a piece that guards e4 which which is usually fairly important so i would think that that's a bit odd bishop f5 i can play bishop f5 i'm not sure if it's a good move you know that's one of those moves that's like attacking things for the sake of attacking it you know i mean what is the point really I might just force him to put his queen on a better square. You know, that's that's what I achieve with that move or what. Um, be careful about doing that kind of stuff. There's also b5, which is pretty interesting. I mean, b5 would probably just drive him back. If he plays knight a3, his knight is on a strange square. And we get a nice extended fianchetto here on the queen side. I mean, it is possible to undermine my extended fianchetto. With a4. Trying to benefit from the c-file. But Baku's again, like another player moving instantly. Um, all you guys gravitate toward my stream who move <laughs> instantly. Why don't I get the players who move slowly? you think with these long time control games, I get a lot of guys who, who like to move real slow. But we've got a lot of guys playing bullet against me in 8 minute chess. Um, Alright. So a6 is possible. We've weakened our queen side a bit with b5. Okay, I can play b4 as well because his queen is unprotected. So that's what I've got to decide here. <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe it's best to just play b4 and get be done with it. <clears throat> In this position, um, rather than be tied down to this weakness like long term, I'm just going to be done with it. We have pressure on the hanging pawns here, a kind of hanging pawns. It's not really a pure hanging pawn structure because I don't have like frontal pressure on both both uh, pawns but I guess these still classify as hanging pawns 
Structurally, black has two pawn islands against three, and that's uh, that's an achievement. April 1st. We know what that means. Yeah, it's really, really weird that I'm starting my first GM tournament in seven years in, in April 1st. Strange coincidence. No, no, but I'm, I'm serious. I don't know what kind of weird shit is going to go down, but that's what it's slated. It's slated to start April 1st. That's really strange. Um, I feel like I've, I'm playing well, though. I um, I have been playing a little too solidly, a little too solidly in my, uh, in my team games. That's basically all I have for training. But the problem with the team games is that you just don't want to lose. And um, I have a lot of draws because I don't want to take any risks in team championship games. In individual games, I'm much more comfortable with uh, with playing more all out for a win. But um, this knight, this choice of square for my knight, I don't know. Maybe I could consider c6. What else to do? The other day I was walking down the street, speaking of April Fool's Day, the other day I was walking down the street and there was this big construction going on at a, at an old building, you know, like a big house. And the whole facade of the house is like, you know, under construction and there's big, like, um, barriers and, and, and um, I don't know how they call it, like platforms where the workers are up like several floors working and stuff. and. There was a there was like a normal ladder down at the bottom, outside the facade, like a you know a two story ladder or something, and I was about to like walk under it when when I looked up and I saw this guy like looking at me weird you know, and I was thinking like, I wonder how the how the you know cultural, um, the cultural differences are as far as like what's what's unlucky or whatever because. I was thinking like walking under a ladder is supposed to be bad luck, but that's like a Western, you know, that maybe that's a Western thing. I don't know, you know, but I feel like this guy was like looking at me weird. So I, I like went around the ladder rather than like walking under because I'm not like overly superstitious, but so I walked around the ladder and avoided the bad luck, but I don't know. Whenever I do that, everyone ends up doing badly. <laughs> Good, let's just do the opposite then. Wish me bad luck. Um, my biggest enemy is playing too, too tight, too solid, I think. Um, I need to be willing to take risks because uh, I tend to, to make too many draws. So I think that's my, my biggest enemy. Um, I really have to like play all out for wins in every game, um, no friendly draws, no accepting draws in slightly better positions or even equal positions. I really have to like, to, to, to make a really, it's not a great tournament really. Um, it's like you have to make plus five typically uh, in, in a nine round tournament that's extremely difficult. Like basically maybe plus four, but probably plus five, which is extremely difficult, so. A lot of strong players can't make GM norms in that kind of tournament, including myself. I mean, but I made a big mistake. There's another good tournament going on in Budapest next week or two weeks from now in, in the Spring Festival. And it's an open with a lot of strong players. And I should have played in that instead. But St. La Vie, since the FIDE did away with um, did away with like round robin requirements for for title norms, um, it would be better just to play in opens all the time, objectively. Now here I could play e6, but it weakens the structure pretty seriously. We could also just not defend e7. It's an option I kind of find. I find sort of appealing. We'll just give him our e7 pawn. We don't need that. It's not important. Um, Got to think outside the box sometimes. This is more like a kind of cheapo, though. Although I think it's useful to get the rook in the game. 
I'm going to eventually have to play rook e8 at some point. I don't think I can defend this pawn indirectly forever. Um, maybe knight e5 just uh, snaps a pawn here. Not so easy, though. What is this? Knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4. Well, that's interesting. Wow. Trade everything, knight f6. Trade everything, knight f6, and then queen takes e7. Queen takes e7, rook takes e7, knight d5. Or we can play knight d5 right away with the idea of knight b4. So there's all kinds of... How's he used down to 248? Um, plus one for knight d5. Yeah, but also knight takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop takes e4. Rook takes e4 wins for me, probably. Everything's good. This is also good, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm not sure if he should take this or not. Objectively. I guess I made a mistake. No. This is fine. <coughs> it's a good thing I saw rookie four in advance. Or not. My very thorough analysis overlooked rookie four, but I have f5. I mean, it's kind of like not surprising that I would have f5 since the rook is on an absolutely horrible square on e4 where it has no mobility laterally. Um, not really surprising that rookie four doesn't work, but. This position is actually, rook, bishop takes d6 probably was holding for white. Um, so bishop takes d6, knight takes, or bishop takes rook e8, bishop c5. I think white's holding on there. He has uh, good chances to hold on. I can't really get at his pawns. Maybe not. Maybe <clears throat> maybe I can play like rook e2 and get on the 7th and start hitting his pawns from the back. Um, black is better, but I think that the spoiler from Shaloda, knight d5, was probably a, a good suggestion. But I don't want to play like moves that people suggest in the stream, so I decided to do it a different way. Usually there's enough delay that people can't really, you know, like, get the spoilers into, uh, and I normally don't look at the screen when I'm playing. I try not to look for suggestions from, from the viewers. <clears throat> but here we're just up a piece, so it's, this is totally decisive. Baku's absolutely had to sack the exchange after, you know, what happened? He can't afford to lose a whole piece as he did here. What did he do wrong, though, objectively? Well, I mean, I guess he didn't have to take anything. I mean, it would have been better not to try to grab material, I guess. Let's see if we can't get back. This looks a little passive, but let's see if we can't get back behind that pawn, um, you know, to blockade it. This should be just simple. Um, I mean, the guy only has one pawn for a piece. My knight is well placed here, although knight knight e6 is good too, keeping an eye on, on that guy. To double check d5. d5, bishop takes a1, takes on c6. That could get a little bit weird. So, I'd like to play knight e6 and d5, but there's no time. I don't want him to play d5. I guess theoretically, <clears throat> I could have played like knight e6, d5, rook a6. But 
two pants past pawns with the bishop wasn't so bad. Yeah, it looked like my best chance would be to play rook e8, rook down on the seventh, and uh, and things might not have been so easy in that line. Now we have a tactic. But I'm not sure if this is really, you know, that easy. I mean, I'm, I'm up, up a lot of material, obviously. Okay, it's, it's easy enough. I mean, you don't have to be Kojak to figure this out. This is a piece up. His pawn's not advanced far enough for it to be really that damaging. Um, what do we want to do here? Bishop c5 is not possible, unfortunately. We have 92 check. Winning the rook. Flash tactics. Famed for my flash tactic ability. All right, man. I don't know. Let's just, just peek at this position. Like when the critical moment when he played, you know, 94 looks like a tactical mistake. Um, yeah, I think 95 is probably best. And apparently, I also have e5, which is not that surprising, I guess. Kind of challenging his whole position. 95 was best. Instead, I played knight takes e4. This is probably like third best move. And I thought, well, I'm not sure if he should take with the queen or the rook here. Yeah, queen takes. Knight f6. Yeah, and he like has to take on e7 because if he goes back, I guess I can just take on c3. I would think. So bishop takes d6 here. Looks like um, knight takes e7, bishop takes e7, rook e8 is basically forced. And it says bishop b4. I was looking at bishop c5, but maybe there's some there's some there's some something to be said for bishop b4 too, guarding the base of his pawn chain. It's kind of a tough position technically to win. All right, constant change. Eight plus three. Why am I always black against you, constant change? Lately, I don't know. It seems like I played the Karo Khan like the last five games or something. That's really weird. There was a time when I used to get white against him, and he's got an awful lot of wins against me lately. Never have a draw. It's like, look at all those wins. No draws. So, lots of Karo Khans lately, but, I mean, let's try to go back to the Sicilian, not forget how to play the Sicilian. Mufrancher said, Mufrancher, can I play you? Um, I'm, I've been in Europe too long, really. I mean, I start pronouncing things all weird. Um, the other day, someone was like, Wi-Fi. And then I spoke to an American, it was Wi-Fi. I forgot it was Wi-Fi. Um, all right, move Francher. <laughs> That's funny. Um, let's see, dude. Yeah, you have to get in the in the line here. We have a queue for challenges. Haggard, DK, Dumb Saint, Ghost Mine, Louis Vetter. We've never played before. Uh, I don't like that I can't like click on hyperlinks anymore and see people's ratings and stuff. Is something disabled with my with my Lee chest that I can't do that anymore? I used to be able to see, you know, a little bubble would pop up and I could see there if they've played enough games and stuff. All right, um, G6. Well, I mean, I've been hanging out in Europe too long. So, we Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi. Especially in Hungary, it's it's hard to get used to how how people pronounce things. What else is Tic Tac? You know, like the candy, the mint, Tic Tac, is Tic Tac. All right, I don't know about this Bacconi variation. You can play like Bishop G seven. Maybe I should play that against him. What would constant change actually do in a Bacconi? Now let's try it. Um, like Bacconi is D takes C five, but Queen a5. There are other names for that, I guess, in Western civilization. I normally play into the hypermodern, hyper accelerated dragon with c takes d. 
But I have the feeling constant change, I don't know. He might have something prepared for me. So C3, the good old C3 Sicilian. Plucro says, yeah, challenge me on Lee Chess. Just do what he says. Plucro, what's up? Our new moderator. We've got Justice Bot here. We've got a plethora of moderators. Plethora or plethora? Does anybody know what the? I always thought it was plethora, but maybe it's plethora. We're investigating all the important linguistic questions in in life here. Muffrancher or Muffrancher? Plethora or pleth plethora? All right. C takes D four. Now. Yeah, you, you get a lot of knight takes d4 when you're playing at the lower levels. Not not a very problematic move. Um, he could actually transpose, he could try to transpose to the smith Moro with bishop c4 there, if he wants to. Uh-oh. Excessive use of caps. All right, so here... Um, I've played this line a few games with white, too. I remember two games in particular. I never had much success with it for some reason with white. But I can't remember Jakob Attila played like knight h6 against me right away, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It seems really early to play a first first move, but I guess we should play knight c6 first. I played bishop g4, and, and Jinji and I worked on bishop g4, but... I think that bishop g4 may have some small problems. It is the main line, I guess. I remember losing to Boris Kreiman once when I played bishop g4 knight bd2, which is like actually a pretty harmless move. How I lost that, um, I don't know. But why would Attila Jakob play knight h6 first? I haven't really looked at this in a long time, to be honest. Um, BG4 still probably the main move alright let's just play knight c6 I don't think the constant change is like booked up on the, he's not really an opening file you know he just plays sensible lines and practical player basically We've had a kind of theoretical discussion in, in the classical Karo Khan lately, where he's got his own ideas that are a little bit different from the main line. Spinal Tap, I may have to consult you for some Karo Khan advice. I don't know if I'll be playing the Karo Khan in, in the upcoming GM tournament I'm playing in. I mean. I guess if it was a really strong opponent I absolutely needed to not lose, I would play the Karo Khan. But as far as playing for a win, I still think it's uh, it's probably only good against hyper-aggressive opponents. Um, Bishop e2, very quiet move. Perfectly okay for white. Um, now bg4 seems to me interesting, but he could he could play something strange there. Actually not. I was thinking about bishop g4. He can't move his knight though, like some knight g5 type of stuff, because I'm winning the d4 pawn. Alright, let's let's do it. Yeah, I mean I think that the, the standard move for white there is probably h3. Um Jinji Jinji lost against Michael Adams once. He was lamenting that game for years. Uh, after something like h3, he played knight h6 and like f6 and went on to lose a long game. Now we could take on f3 like unprovoked actually. But I guess there's no reason to do that. There's really no reason to do that right away, I suppose. How many times I've played this line with, with, with black and, and I lost some bad games with white. I lost to, let's see. Well, I guess I drew with Jakob Attila. I, I lost to Jozef Horvath in, in a rapid game, I remember, with white once. Um, 
Sometimes certain positions you just can't play for either side. Bishop c8 is the worst black piece here, so an idea to develop an earlier trade. The bishop c8, you know, if you watch my streams, I'm constantly talking about this. Uh, the queen's bishop, if you want to talk old school, um, the queen's bishop is always the bad piece, you know, in, in almost every opening, especially when you're black. Sometimes the queen's knight, like in the queen's Indian, the b8 knight is hard to get out. I guess there's some other openings where the king's knight could be bad, like here. Um, this is my worst piece, theoretically. BG5 feels active, but it's probably a mistake. We've got too much pressure on the D4 pawn. This is kind of a stereotypical way that white can mess up in this line. I never played this before against constant change, but I had to kind of dig deep to trick him out of a position he's really used to. By playing this, this move order with, with g6, um, he's not accustomed to me doing that. He's not really a d4 player, and I think that's a problem for people who face this, like uh, c5, bishop g7. You know, e4 players typically uh, oftentimes don't feel comfortable playing a Benoni with d5, and thus uh, have some problems, you know, adjusting here. D5 is probably the best move. Feel the D4 creepiness. When are you playing the tournament? April Fool's Day. I'm, I'm going to be playing all the first 10 days of... First 10, 11 days of, of April, I'm going to be playing tournament games. I have uh, the first Saturday Grandmaster tournament, and, um, and also I have to play uh, my, my team in the Hungarian Team Championship is uh is fighting for survival all right what if we take on f3 here bishop takes f3 bishop takes f3 queen takes b2 snap a pawn um then he plays something like knight d2 we, we run away and and just try to uh take our take our pawn to the bank <clears throat> bishop takes looks like anyway <clears throat> that piece uh this is another structure with the bishop pair, just isn't really very useful. Kind of like an exchange Slav or something. Actually, he has to be careful. I mean, we could try to be greedy, but... No, we can't take a second pawn. Well, I guess we could, actually. It looks too greedy. Knight takes d4, rook b1. Why that's too much counterplay there? I guess we have to play queen back to b6. It's not the only square. Um, knight takes d4, rook b1. Knight takes f3, check. <clears throat> We're going to drop the b7 pawn. I'm not really interested in that. I mean, we could choose a different square, like a3 or something. But then I'll waste time, you know, having to protect my queen side. He just played knight b3 straight away. He looks like he has some compensation here, actually. Hopefully not enough. A little bit of compensation for white but these bishops are pretty limited <clears throat> nice nice tactic there buddy knight a5 is even possible it looks kind of weird though he's threatening knight d7 winning exchanges this is very awkward for me. All right. At the end of the day, hopefully he's still tied down to d4. To play rook b8, probably. Protect my b7 pawn. 
He has a pretty strong compensation here. I don't know what I did wrong. Maybe I shouldn't have taken the B2 pawn. Was there another path to take? Seems strange. What am I supposed to do in that position instead of taking the B3 pawn? I mean, is there really another option here? The B2 pawn, whatever it is, B3, B2. It doesn't really seem like there's another option. I don't understand like what I did wrong. If I did something wrong, it's not apparent to me. Um, now here, you know, knight d8 is like ridiculously passive. b6 maybe. The problem with b6, I guess, weakens the c-file defense a little bit. Um, but it's still probably a good move, huh? Then his white square bishop's going to become kind of a menace. If I play b6... How big a deal is that, though? You know, that's the real question. Maybe better to play rook b8. If I play rook b8, then I'm never going to be able to play b6. You know, then I'll have to face knight a6 all the time. Probably better to do it this way. I have queen, queen d7. Question is where to go. Queen d7. I need like one free moment to, to play maybe knight f5, tie him down to d4. Knight a6. His knight's a little bit misplaced on a6. Hard to see how it's going to get back in the game from there. And back on b4. I don't know. I guess a French defense player might be happy with my position, but I feel like it's kind of passive, you know. I don't like taking material and losing the initiative. Alexander Ivanov, Korchnoi style, you know, like hit and run. You take material and then you run away and you're like, da -da 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 -da. I took your pawn and I'm going to just like, you know, defend. But I don't really like passive defense. Um, Queen c8 is possible. Queen d7 looks the best. We can finally castle, but he's he's like a machina. Still, you know, I mean, we can get out of this pin, and there's a limited amount of things he can do to me. Bishop b5 is nice. He goes right for it, but um, he's not actually threatening anything, first of all. I guess knight b4 should be avoided. So here we are, suffering for a pawn. Computer would love this for black. I mean, oh, we're up a pawn. We just have to play perfect moves and then win. I mean, it's easy. But I don't, I don't really like being passive. Now here is an interesting moment because we might have knight a5 coming up. Rook c1 doesn't look inherently dangerous. His knight is stuck. Um, objectively, knight a5. I can also play knight f5 now. Knight f5, tying him down to d4. That looks good. So maybe taking out his bishop. As pawn-like as that bishop is... Um, Whoa, he just dropped d4. That's good. That's good for me, right? I think he didn't see that this was a possibility. Um, and I'm not sure. Maybe I should take the other way. I should take the other way. Yeah. The other way is better, I guess. He wants a take back? Seriously, dude? With like 40 seconds after I discussed the position? Um... All right, man. You can have a take back. It's not really like, um, <laughs> not really standard to ask for a take back with one minute left on the clock, dude. But uh, all right, we'll let it slide this time. Not really standard procedure here. What should I play now? h5 
h5 is possible. Yeah, a non-standard take back. I don't encourage you other guys to offer take backs. I know he's never done that in time pressure before. If you like early in the game hang your queen or something or make a mouse slip, take backs are appropriate. But not like with under a minute on the clock. Um this is definitely not not really standard. All right, we've got to watch for bishop a6. Bishop a6. Maybe h5. <laughs> Take back. Where did you come up with that idea? With under a minute on the clock. And now he's like gonna blitz me and beat me after the take back. That's a good move, actually. A4, phenomenal move actually. All right, no take back under a minute on the clock. Unless, <laughs> I don't know, unless you make a mouse slip or something. Um, Haggard DK, I don't know. That was a pretty serious counterplay for white, for the pawn there. Um, Haggard DK. Guys, thanks for joining me. Don't forget to check out the YouTube channel, Video Chess Training on YouTube. Spinal Tap, I don't know if he's still here. It looks like he might have logged off. Sometimes he'll occasionally challenge me, though lately he hasn't done so. International Master Spinal Tap, Fide Master Justice Bot were here earlier. USA time. Good to have some strong players hanging out with us though. Um, with us fish. He better give you a take back also. Well, I, I always say that I'll give one take back during the stream. But I never had anybody offer the take back in such time pressure before. That's kind of weird. Um... Usually it's like every man for himself once as far as I'm concerned like once once we're under a minute on the clock um, It's it's a blitz bullet game Not everybody will always do it, but I, I definitely have a soft spot in my heart for for mouse slips so and I really expect that from other people as well I mean if there's a mouse slip you really should give someone a take back, you know, okay if it's a tournament game or whatever I understand but if it's not a tournament game, um, and in a tournament game, it's your, up to your judgment. But I really think that, you know, sometimes people make mouse slips because they pre-move and stuff. So you can't really feel sorry for that. But um, I'm not even going to take this exchange, guys. I, I've had this discussion before. And um, in my view, this, this bishop is worth, you know, a lot because it's the guardian of my king side. It's also a very powerful piece. And, and I just don't think that, you know, I want to take any risks since I'm up a clear pawn. If I wasn't up a pawn in this position, I would be more inclined to take the exchange on a1. And again, like hit and run and take material and, and then roll up into a ball and, and like try to win um, by consolidating. But when you're up material like this, like a clear pawn up for nothing, um, I think that you need to limit the amount of risks you take, you know, or at least it's practical to do so. So I just have no interest in taking a, a rook on a1 and now a lot of strong players might have a different opinion about that kind of thing you know like people are very materialist certain players are very materialistic um but it's a matter of style i guess you know i just i like my dark squared bishop i like the dragon bishop um it's a position where rooks aren't all that useful in the middle game with so many pawns on board um you know i would I would say if you want to take the rook on a1, 
that's up to you, you know. Um, but it's it's a difficult game to play in a kind of abstract position after that. And again, if I wasn't up a pawn, I'd probably snap it. But now I'm just winning. I mean, I have a lot of confidence in my technique. And um, here maybe I shouldn't rush with knight h to f5. That's still a good move. It doesn't really matter. Well, I, I mean, you know, it's one thing if it's like a tournament game and you have lots and lots and lots of unlimited time to calculate, like, but I think in a practical game where you don't have a lot of time, I'm more inclined not to take that material there. You know, it's it's just really up to you, but normally white gets some compensation for that kind of rook and uh, and that might, that might cause some difficulties for me, so... If I wasn't, if he wasn't, if he wasn't castled here already, um, you know, I might be concerned about something like g4, but not gonna bother me now. He might end up trading my rook, my bishop off anyway. This is kind of a tough call. Mm, maybe rook b8. I've got to watch out. I don't allow some kind of discovery here with um, rook b8 rook b8 b6 and uh, this, this bishop takes c6 would win a piece but his knight is in the way <laughs> so he I'm play I'm planning basically like b6 bishop b7 something like that to uh, to trade his his um, white square bishop off G4 is very weakening for white here. He's castled king's side. I'm not worried about a big attack. Plus knight d4 is going to threaten to win his queen. When I go here, he's going to have to take time to defend e2. So this is just, just lost for white, objectively. He's got some counterplay, but not really. Um, you know, the the tendency there is to like automatically and dogmatically play like rook e8. But I don't know, you know, what is he going to do? Play g4? and weaken his king side to force me to play knight d4 so he can play bishop h6 and trade off my dark squared bishop in the interim he has to deal with like knight takes e2 actually he can't even do that he probably has to play e4 here and then play like knight d4 rook e1 or e4 knight d4 knight takes d4 knight takes d4 rook e1 and then he's maybe thinking about playing bishop h6 but at that point, I can play e5 and just let him trade dark square bishops and just be up a pawn. Queen a3. Well, that is a weird move. I'm not sure what that's about. He's attacking a7. Um, interesting. So maybe knight a5 at some point. And, um... Hmm. Probably not a big deal. B5, knight a5, knight takes a5. Or I even, yeah. Alright. This queen is awkwardly placed. We're going to play b4 at some point. I was thinking knight a5, knight takes a5. He doesn't really want to trade queens down a pawn. Um, this is just a very artificial location for his queen to be. And, uh,. What else? Knight a5, knight takes a5, bishop takes a5, queen d7. This is typical for this structure. Okay, he just dropped a piece. Probably unawares that my knight is protecting my rook. We also have b4, so... b4 allows queen a4, which is not winning a piece. So, we can take on c3 and take on c4, or take on c4 right away. Does it really matter? It might matter. I mean, his queen is less active on c3, I guess. Take. Take on c3. Then take on c4. And then he's not hitting a7. So we win a piece for a pawn. That's, uh, you guys are generous today. Um, 
No, seriously. Wade just played a little carelessly in the opening, dropping that pawn on b2. But I, I really believe this is a practical way of playing, you know. Knight g5. As far as that whole business with taking the rook on a1 goes, I definitely have talked about this before. Alright, what do we want to do? Knight d4. Rook takes rook. Or just bishop d7. I'm not greedy. We don't want to give up the b file. Defend our knight. Keep control of the b file. You can have this pawn. He's also got queen coming across or something. Try to mate me with the knight and queen. It's not going to happen. Knight d4. But I take every game seriously, you know. Um, never let up because you're playing a low-rated opponent or because you're up material. I mean, I've, I've made too many mistakes to uh, to continue to do that. Bishop d5, e6. This is actually a little bit tricky. I have to watch out for like knight e4. Knight back to e4. Man, I cannot draw an arrow. And knight f6 check sometimes. So e6, knight e4. What if I play knight d4 first, followed by, let's let's take this first, rook takes, followed by knight d4, followed by e6. If I play knight d4, he has actually a move there. So I should play e6, now he has bishop takes c6. Knight d4, knight d4, knight e4, knight d4. Bishop takes c6, we're just up a piece. Alright. Anyway, it's a piece up. It's good enough. Probably added better ways to do this. d5 is ultra weak, bishop g2 might be good. Um, anyway, we're just... You mean like me playing e5 at some point, a point he was talking about? Constant change. I'm winning against GM Castor Sito. Castor Sito seems to be... Uh, he has a little chess addiction going on. Um, ultra strong bullet player. But I wasn't happy with him. I, I don't know, like... Last year I had a blitz game with him on ICC and he... He was like playing on for too long and like rook and pawn versus rook and pawn trying to flag me or something. It was it kind of is a pet peeve of mine. I don't really like people who play for time in dead drawn positions. But whatever, man. I mean I don't really know him. He seems like he's alright. But I'm not a bullet player. I, I don't <laughs> I don't like that Oligus type type of stuff where you try to play for a time in, in dead drawn positions. But eventually he offered a draw after like torturing me for 50 moves in a drawn position or something. Um, but I mean that's kind of kind of dirty. I don't like I don't like that dude. Um, but he's not as not as bad as Oligas. But these guys who play bullet constantly um, have a tendency, you know, when people are like treat you badly enough after a time, uh, basically like you play a lot of bullet. And a lot of people like play for flag with like rook against rook with no pawns on the board. I think what happens is that eventually like you turn into one of them, you know, like eventually like so many people screw you and, and are like unsportsmanlike that eventually, you know, you're like, screw it, I just hate everybody. I'm gonna just like flag everybody in drawn positions. So probably Castor Cito's like been like flagged in so many rook against rook positions, he started doing it to other people. Um So I think he's probably a decent guy, but really hardcore uh, hardcore bullet addict from what I know um, Dumb Saint, Ghost Mine, Liberian Muff Rancher and Dims alright yeah I understand constant change um, you're playing another game at the same time Dumb Saint We're going to play uh, maybe e4, e5. Let's try e4, e5. We haven't played this in a while. And um, we're 
we're essentially trading instead of having no weaknesses. Well, I mean, I'm up a pawn. It should be a winning position, you know. And my argument is, why do you need more material? If you're up a clear pawn after 10 moves, okay, you can, you can be up a clear pawn after 10 moves in basically a winning position. If your technique is good enough to win a clear pawn up, or you can try to be greedy and take more material, um, which allowing, you know, allowing some weaknesses and some counterplay, you know, or making the position a little bit like, you know, more, uh, more difficult to win. Yeah, I like, I like the practical approach. But if, if it was a situation where I wasn't up a pawn, as I said before, and the guy just offered me the exchange on A1, I'd probably take it, you know, because I don't have a pawn in the bank. I mean, that's a different situation. But my technique at my level is good enough that a clear pawn up after 10 moves. If I can't win that, you know, then I don't deserve to win the game. I mean, a clear pawn up is, is a lot of material at the master level. I mean, you really, 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 cases, that should be enough to win the game, hands down. And if you can't win a clear pawn up, you need to improve your technique. I mean, that's all there is to it. A lot of people at the lower levels don't have a lot of confidence. I was talking to someone about this yesterday. They don't have a lot of confidence in their technique. So they would probably take the material in that situation and be like, I need more material before I'm really like, you know, I'm really confident in, in the fact that I'm, you know, I'm up enough to win. But I think that objectively, like, a healthy pawn should be enough for a master level player to convert a win. I mean, Baku said hippo, elephant. Um, hippo and elephant are very different animals in chess opening sense. All right, so Dumb Saint, this could be a mainline Petrov. We haven't played one of these in a long time. Um, I like and also play the setup he's playing with white, the main line with bishop d3 and d4. Here now, castles is the best move. There are other lines. Michael Hoffman, Grandmaster from Germany, friend of mine, plays like knight c3. We had some games with that line, I think. It's pretty solid. Or you can castle and then play knight c3. C3, however, that to me looks like um, ultra quiet move, which this could even transpose to like an exchange French or something. My knight on C6 here. Feels more like an exchange French. Okay, typically I'm playing bishop D6. I'm sorry, bishop E7 in the lines where white plays C4, but now wondering if I should play more aggressively. This is not a move that's, that's standard in this position, c3, and I'm not really sure what the best is. You could try to castle queenside, like like Alekhin in, in the French exchange. Um, it's pretty risky for black. I'm not sure we really have time. Something like bishop g4. He's secured d4, though. Let's see, like bishop g4, castles. What am I going to do to protect e4, then? He's going to be playing like Castle's Rook E1. Well, that could transpose to a line, I guess. Bishop E7 is the safe move. I don't know. I mean, trying to castle Queenside here, that's that's pretty, pretty psycho-aggressive, honestly. Seems a little over the top. Um, Bishop D6, though. Yeah, we could just play bishop d6, and then for f5 or something, really, really aggressive. Well, let's try it. There are some lines like this, I remember. Frank Marshall played black in the Petrov sometimes. This is inherently more aggressive than playing bishop e7. And you could consider... If you had time to play bishop g4, queen d7, and try to castle long, again, like Alekhin style, French exchange variation. Do you think one pawn up for a 2200 playing a GM with an equal or slightly better position is enough for a win? No. No, I think that 400 points or whatever makes a big difference. 300 points, whatever. 300 rating points is probably 
worth a pawn or so. I think that the typical Grandmaster rated around 2,500 could probably give pawn odds to a 2,200 and come out all right. Um, yeah, that would probably be a, a fairly good material balance for like a standard game. I think, yeah, one pawn odds for a 300 point rating difference is probably about fair. Knight bd2. This looks like really passive for white now. Um, if I play, I could play castles, and he probably can't take the piece on e4. He'll lose a piece. But ultimately, what's my plan there? How am I going to maintain it? The other possibility would be obviously bishop f5, but I don't like it. Um, f5 right away is interesting. But I'm probably castling kingside. So he's playing fast too. Six minutes to my 3.5. I'm not playing a lot of Petros lately, so I'm not that used to this position. Um, Alright, let's just go for f5. A little early, maybe. I don't know. f5, queen b3 happens sometimes in these type of positions. Yeah, it's probably safer to castle. Alright. Let's castle. I don't think he can take the pawn. It's uh, it's poisoned along the e-file. So that question is what I do next. F5 is risky. Oh, we have some plans now. It's coming back to me slowly. You know, um, this this could transpose to a typical kind of position. Yeah, F5. Frank Marshall would, would enjoy this. So queen b3 might even be theory. I'm not sure. Um, but this is definitely not a line I play very often. The Gladys Troll, what's up, man? Queen b3, king h8. The d5 pawn is also poisoned. And um, it's a sharp position after that. Black's looking for a kingside attack here. That's about as much as I know um, about this particular line. Queen b3, king h8, and play some chess and aim at the white king. That would be the extent of my knowledge. It's hard to think of the Petrov as an attacking opening, but there are some lines that actually develop that way. I don't know if he, I don't know if he's watching the stream or not, but if he's listening while we're playing, then he heard what I'm talking about. Queen b3, king h8, this pawn is, is uh, this pawn is taboo, at the moment anyway, not forever, oh no, really dude, see, <laughs> that's more appropriate, take back, um, than the other one, but anytime a strong player offers you material, I mean, you've got to be, you know, you got to learn your lesson. I mean, I, I'm not going to give you material for free in most cases. you got to be very circumspect when a strong player offers material. You know, at least take the time to think about it. Um, that's an important pawn. That's my central pawn. Um, I'm not going to just give it up for free. There may be circumstances where I can sacrifice it you know, for development or something. And that, that's what he was thinking, I guess. You know, or he was looking at other stuff, like trying to trap his queen in other ways, probably. I wouldn't be surprised if this is this is theory, um, probably up until queen takes d5. But there's no games in here. It looks to me like it should be theory. The move order is very strange, but... I'm almost certain I've analyzed this position before.
queen b3 best king h8 and now yeah there's it's like a stonewall attack the lead chess database doesn't include a lot of older games so it's very possible there's some games in this position as i said i'm almost certain i know a martial game um in this line and but you're not going to find games from like the the 1930s or 1920s or 1910 in in the lead chess database uh, unfortunately it looks like white still according to the engine a tiny bit better there but not such an easy position to play slightly passive line with c3 white should castle and play c4 all right ghost mind that was fast but i believe in learning your lesson you know dumb saint he's gonna be like damn you know what when higher rated players offer material i'm gonna learn and learn my lesson and think about it um think about it a little bit harder you know don't take candy from strangers that's what we take away from the last game um Ghost Mind has been known to play some very strange openings. On occasion, he'll go real straight normal with the, with the openings, though. Um, so far, very standard. Cell Sword says, "Sorry, I said I played a garbage move. I used the word a fifty-five. Don't take it personally, Cell Sword. That's what you got in trouble." What is, really? What is, it? like A55 is not allowed? Or garbage is a bad word? Oh well, we'll forgive you. Okay, Ghostmine playing like a delayed sort of Smith Mora type of thing here. I have Knight F6. But it's not the, it's not the two knights defense, you know, like E5, D5. That's interesting, like e5, d5, e takes f6, d takes c. That's better for black than the, what is it called? Um, like in e4, e5 openings, like the max lang, or would that be a max lang if it was e4, e5 instead of e4, c5? What is that variation called? Um, where you take an f6 and black takes on c4. I guess it's the max lang. Um, Right, but this is another problem here that doesn't exist in uh, in e4, e5, of course. We have queen a5 check, right? So we play knight takes, knight takes, queen a5 check. And we're going to pick that knight up. And, I mean, I would imagine this, this is good for black. Because you're going to be up two pawns here. He doesn't have an in-between Zwitschenzog, like bishop takes f7, because obviously we're taking with a knight on e5. So he just like hung a pawn. I mean, maybe white has a little bit of compensation. I think he'll probably get one of the pawns back, but it just basically trades material um, in, in a position where it's, it's a gambit line and trading material is good for me because I'm trying to consolidate like a pawn up gambit type of position. So. If I can trade a set of knights, especially like a queenside knight for a kingside knight, you know, that seems that seems good for me. Um, okay, now what? Bishop b3. You know, I don't really want to go out of my way to bring his queen in play, you know, on f3. Although it's probably good enough for black. What else can I do? We can delay it a move with something like e6. e6, castles, knight takes f3, queen takes f3. How do I develop the rest of my pieces here? Maybe d6. But he has, oh, okay, bishop a4 check is probably not a big deal. d6. I'm getting a little bit fancy with ideas of, like, bishop g4. I think that I'm going the wrong 
I'm going the wrong way here mentally, you know. I need to develop my king side. And um, usually I get in trouble if I develop just my queen side pieces in the Sicilian and ignore my king. So that's probably not the best idea for me. Um, here we should try to be accurate. Knight takes f3 check, queen takes f3. And what then? Like e5? Feels like I'm wasting wasting time weakening the white squares. We're up two pawns here. I cannot hold on to both. We're going to definitely have to give one back. And we need to catch up in development. So... This is not a joke. Um, I don't want to waste too much time, and I want to get developed. We're going to have to give a pawn back. All right. Eventually, we're going to have to resolve this one way or another. I'm probably going to have to take on f three sooner or later, you know, just to conserve time. But we do have queen a5 check and queen e5 check. Queen a5 check... And queen e5 check. Yeah, actually. That makes sense. That might mess him up. His king has stayed in the center too long. And now we can check him and force him to like forfeit his castling right. This actually looks looks like best. We're down to 130, but probably found the best line. Using all that time. Why does a donkey and a human butt have the same name? Good question. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's probably the key to the question. Um, I bet the donkey came first, you know? And then people started using it for other other terminologies. Um, maybe not, though. We're up a pawn, and white loses his right to castle, so we're happy that we took the time to find probably the best move. I could easily have played some secondary second best lines where white would have had fairly decent compensation it's really useful to, to take your time and of course here you know after this he has like practically no compensation he's down two pawns um, if I take on c3 he takes on c3 and the knights like come into b5 in some lines that's a little awkward to me um I'd almost rather like give him the pawn back than deal with that. Bishop c5 is interesting. Bishop c5. All right, we're going to run out of time. Bishop c5 is illegal. That's bad when you start hallucinating about illegal moves. That's a sign that you have a problem. Let's see, b6. Now, you can have the pawn, dude. You know what? Help yourself. All right. Should I check? I don't need the second pawn. I actually hallucinate my bishop can jump over. Jump over e7. That's optimism. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You gotta love it. Got a great game here. Pawn up, isolated pawn on d4. The white king in the way of the white pieces, coordinating on the back rank. It's absolutely winning position. I'm not sure where I should go. Rook c8, perhaps? There's always bishop b7 switching diagonals again, too. I really need to move quickly, though. Bishop d6. What's wrong with that? I don't know. He 
he could have a little bit of counterplay. But I'm not going to allude allude to what it is. Actually, I have knight g4 sometimes here. I'm getting out of here. Okay, he traded off his isolated pawn. But at the cost of opening a file against his own king is, is a pretty high price to pay to liquidate that isolated pawn. So I don't mind. Guys are going to be streaming for another hour. H4. I have knight g4 at some moment. I talked about that already. Alright, let's just not lose on time. h4 is a pretty good move, dude. He could actually play um, something like rook h3. Yeah, man. That's amazing. He's playing like Shirov. Uh, F4. Alright, that's a strange recapture. Up until there, I really was starting to get a little bit worried. But when he takes with the pawn on C3, I mean, Bishop takes C3 would have brought some, some heat down on G7. And uh, with, with the tandem of, of some knight, rook G3 threats, I, I could... I could be a little bit worried. Um, but as it stands now, black is just winning. We'd like to trade off his bishop pair. You know, that'll kill his counterplay. He's two pawns down. Absolutely zero compensation. Getting faster though. But he gave it a fight, gave me a fight this time. And I'm down to 19 seconds. I had to use all my time. I'm pretty sure that my my decision to play Queen A5 check and Queen E5 was a good call. If I hadn't found that, you know, he would have had really pretty reasonable like Mora Gambit counterplay. Normally I wouldn't consider taking a bishop like this, but I mean around here, you know, with two pawns up, I wouldn't even mind taking this this pawn, especially here since I'm, I'm winning another pawn. Could have taken it last move. That would have been a little more accurate. All right, it's uh, I think he earlier should have gone for some counterplay with a4, you know, at some point, trying to advance the a pawn much much earlier maybe. 10 moves ago or, or 12 moves ago once we had, when we had first reached this this ending basically um, all right let's keep him kind of paralyzed a little bit of counterplay there yep he's getting counterplay look how fast he is he's like feisty um Got a little bit of feistiness left in him. Down three pawns. <laughs> this is kind of irritating. Like, how do I finish him off? Um, my impulse was to play rook g5, but then this king starts walking up over here. This is kind of funny. I, <laughs> I can't play king d6. I can't play rook g5. And now we could play king d6, maybe. Just slowly. It's, it's annoying how difficult it is to finish white off here. It's, it's almost irritating. Um, three pawns down and it's like difficult to finish the guy off. That's That's hard to understand, really. Now finally, no, that doesn't even work. B4 doesn't work. All right, how do I finish this off, seriously? Well, everything works, but it's all relative, right? But now it's check. Now C2's with check. I'm just not allowing any counterplay, that's our business. He's had enough. All right, man, good fight. 
just as uh, just for fun, I want to see if I played the best move there. Um, it's obviously not non theoretical position. So here I thought for like two minutes, and uh, it's interesting because the computer says knight takes f3, queen takes f3, e6. But I would think um, the queen a5 check would be a clear improvement on e6. Yeah, now it it's really thinking about it, but I don't know. I mean, how could, could queen a5 check not be a good move in this position for black? It's saying e6, d5, but man, that's weird. I mean, c3, that's the game, right? That's crazy. King f1. I don't know, but in my opinion, forfeiting his right to castle is a pretty serious concession. I would think I played the best line. Computer doesn't agree. Um, Liberian's up six plus three. So Liberian, I don't remember what happened the last time he was white. It was a while ago. When he was black last time, we played the Queen's Gambit. I'm going to play g6, modern defense. This is actually a very good winning attempt against anybody who's lower rated. Occasionally, you'll see people playing it against higher rated players. I think that's risky business. I recently did a video for chesslecture.com, and this is a, a game I annotated where this Canadian I am, Bindi Chang, played g6 against Ivan Chuk, you know? Like, I don't know what you're thinking, really. Playing g6 with black against Ivan Chuk. It seems like a strange way to play against a much stronger player. But against weaker players, um, I mean, if your repertoire is only g6, then that's all you can play, obviously. But in general, I think, I think this kind of ultra-hyper-modern type of stuff with g6... It, the best the best is to use it to try to beat weaker players um, that's that's the standard approach if that's your repertoire that's your repertoire what can you do all right he played e3 giving us a really really um, kind of passive Benoni although I've, I've told the story a lot how Gelfand lost twice in this with black against Mamad Yarov because he doesn't play the Benoni I can see doing that against Gelfand because he's such an expert in, in certain openings like the Grunfeld, King's Indian. Um, you just like will do anything to get him out of his book. You know, with with a specialist like Boris Gelfand, I could see it. Um, B5 is no good, obviously. I have to play Benoni here. But if you're a King's Indian player, then um, playing the Benoni is kind of almost necessary. And in the old days, I remember when I was first learning chess, there was some... I remember a book by Matanovich or some Yugoslav GM. They actually classified the Benoni as like basically the same opening as the King's Indian. The modern modern uh, opening theoreticians typically consider them separate. But years ago, um, C5 was another branch of the King's Indian, oftentimes. So Bishop E2. Now... I really don't have any choice. I mean, it's basically e5 or e6 in this position. e5 would lead to a king's Indian type position. I think e6 is better. Because he's wasted a tempo off the normal Benoni. And that should be, should be the best approach for black. e5, I don't think the extra tempo will matter as much if I choose to play e5. White probably plays something like knight d2. And I'm playing a king's Indian with c5 and e5, which is not really uh, that dangerous. Okay, so here black can play either recapture, I guess. We can take back with the pawn, hoping to play for d5, or we can take back with the bishop, hoping to play for d5. Um, I don't think that this is the best move. You know, probably after e6, white should just um, 
follow some games that I talked about, like Delphan played Black against Mamadyarov. I remember older games. I remember once Kramnik losing to, um, like, 10 years ago. I remember a game where Kramnik lost with Black against, uh, I think it was Kramnik losing with Black against Morozevich in this line. The, the Benoni with E3, basically. But taking on E6 is probably harmless. After that, I mean, white doesn't have any, you know, real development, and, and there's no way to exploit this open file. He's not well enough developed. Bishop takes e6, or pawn takes e6 here. I mean, bishop takes is probably a little bit more... more classical, developing a piece. Now he's going to have to lose the tempo. I thought e4 right away is probably best. I'm not sure though. Let's wait and see what he does here. You see, the problem is he can't play b3 because of knight e4. And now he, he starts to have some ideas, like bishop f4, pressuring d6. Of course, there's lots of possibilities for black. I can play for control of the d4 square. Rook e8, bishop f4. Also interesting is queen b6, bishop f4, rook d8. Well, queen b6 just ties him down to uh, to b2 as well, so there's some logic in that. All right, he's very fast. I mean, I um, I guess this is a pawn sacrifice. Not exactly, huh? That's weird. Oh, we have a neat little trick here. <laughs> totally unplanned, but if queen takes d6, knight d4, queen takes b6, knight takes e2 check. I have to take back, though. Uh, that still looks good for black. Damn. Like, queen takes d6, knight d4, queen takes b6, knight takes e2 check, knight takes e2, a takes b. When c4 is hanging, e4 is hanging, and my two bishops are, like, raking the long diagonals. Um... That's probably a lot of counterplay for black. Didn't really think about it, but... Uh, this is actually a really strong threat. If queen takes d6. I should be a little more careful about calculating things before I play them, but... Um, Thanks for joining me, everybody. It's Tuesday. We're playing Blitz and Classical Chess for another 45 minutes. I'm International Master William Pascal. I'm here Monday to Friday. We've been doing this for over a year on Lee Chess, successfully helping you guys to improve your game, um, helping me to train as well. So Knight A4, off the side. It's really, really good to see that move. There may be some concrete idea behind it. <sighs> Method to the madness, as they say. Okay. Well, all right, whatever. I don't really see a better square. Worst comes to worst, I can play knight e5 to guard, you know, my c5 pawn from knight takes c5. And he goes back now. Interesting. Well, one would assume a6, right? 
A6 certainly isn't a bad move. I mean, it's a normal Benoni idea. I want to play for this. Reminds me of it reminds me of a game like Stahlberg Larson or something like that. Is that does that seem possible? Could Larson have played Stahlberg? I don't know if that's possible. It's got to be possible. Maybe I'm confusing Stahlberg with someone else. But, okay, he eventually cracks and trades something on, on d5. The problem is I don't really have that much here. Um, I do have knight h5, though. Looks kind of funky. Knight h5, bishop g5. Uh-oh. I don't like that. Where am I going with my knight, Mr. Knight? And we're losing on time? Knight a5 is interesting. I guess we should play knight b8. I mean, I don't know. Well, it looks like white's all right after all that. I'm really sure what I'm supposed to do here. Fourteen seconds to his three minutes. I don't know, guys. BG5. They, there I could have sacked the exchange, maybe. The bishop takes b2. Probably not a bad try. Sack the exchange? I think that's reasonable here. He defends his pawn. It's kind of a strange move, but um, this guy's getting tougher every time I play him. Two minutes. Damn, it's like playing a pro. All right, I feel like I'm playing Mama Yarov or something. We're really compact here, though. Kind of hard for him to use his bishops. Incredibly fast, though. What? Jeez, this is like very, very tough play by whites like a GM. Um, I feel like I'm playing Bobby Fischer or something. Ivan Farago. All right, let's play. Wow, B4. It's impressive. Jeez. <laughs> Liberian took his Wheaties today, dude. Playing GM strength in this game. BG5 though. It's kind of a weird move. All right.
the way he's playing this is sort of unbelievable. Definitely GM strength. I don't know, man. I mean, you're playing like 2,500 in this game. Both, both on the board and, and time-wise, too. The way he's avoided certain exchanges and uh, and gone for others. This this is another move that's extremely strong for white. Queen d3. I'm like hanging on by my fingernails here. He avoids an exchange there. Check it out. Time usage. Wow, dude. We don't play him very often, but he seems to be getting stronger. That's a mistake, finally. I'm surprised he traded queens. He was systematically avoiding queen exchanges the whole time. Probably B6 was a mistake by me. I mean, this guy is, is a strong master. I don't know. Liberian is only 2,076, but man, he played like GM level here. Just some mistakes toward the end there. Tiny mistakes. Now it's actually a mistake by me still a draw though well that's a surprise this is he could have won a pawn with bishop d3 actually That's a very, very strong game by White. I mean, I was basically lost positionally. I mean, I don't know, man. That was really, really strong. Probably the best game you ever played against me. This this looks like it was uh, not a good opening, but then he started to play, like, unbelievable. Um, 
from this point forward in a technical part here. Maybe I should have played knight d4. And um, now it was just pure torture. I thought this would be a draw pretty easily, but white just tortures me. Queen e3, queen e7. All right, I'm not going to rehash it, but I thought I was going to lose that. Troll on a roll, 5 plus 3. We will play a couple of chess 960 guys if you want to. Um, definitely master strength gain from Liberian. I felt like I was getting tortured by a higher rated player. Um, all right. Troll on the roll. This is a knight on the corner is bad. Chess 960. Haven't played troll in a long time. Let's get our corner knight in the game. This is kind of hyper modern opening, but I'm not a big believer in knights on a8. That was tough, man. Very unpleasant and fast, you know. Not only was he strong, but extremely fast. That felt like I was playing like a 2500 player. Who was in a generous mood and let me draw <laughs> at the end. Um, after getting tortured. Now the classical center, you gotta argue, that's, that's, pretty, that's a pretty good opening there. I think I should have answered with symmetry. I should have played d5. This is probably a position where I can't afford anything else, basically. Um, you're not going to find so many people playing this, what I did here. It looks like a bad Alekhine's defense. Well, whatever. We're giving him the center and trying to counterattack. And we'll see what happens. Give up the center and counterattack. I can castle, right? Then I walk right into like bishop h6. Actually, he's got bishop h6, man. I'm crazy. He's got bishop h6. This is terrible. Knight b6 followed by g6. I really need to pay closer attention to what I'm doing. This is not a good opening for me. It's like a passive bad Pierce defense. Man. I'm not sure that castling really helps. <laughs> it doesn't really change too much. Um, we'll try to play for e5 if I can get it. And then we might be okay. Exchange sacrifice, anybody? No. Did not have fun last game. I felt like... I felt like Gelfand. The e3 Benoni. Very dangerous system for white. Abe Goal says, I'm 2500. We can only see you, not here. I don't understand if that's Liberian talking. Why well, he's using the plural form of we. All right, I guess we should castle. Oh, it's not. <laughs> should I take with a rook or take with the king? Equally, equally bad either way. All right, king takes g7. I say we a lot when I'm talking about. Do I say it sometimes? I'm e5. But that's that's good. That feels good to get the pawns on the dark squares. With my white squared bishop and, and his white squared bishop on h1. So theoretically, he could end up being worse because he ends up with a bad bishop hemmed in by his own pawn at e4. I feel like we've gotten away with something here. You know, he traded off his better bishop for a, a kind of non existent attack, and um, we've got some stake in the center now with e5. How is castling in 960? You can castle, the king goes to its normal location on either side of the board. My problem is, like, I don't know whether to call the king side the king side or the queen side the queen side anymore. That's my biggest issue in chess 960. I don't know what to call things as far as location goes. <laughs> um, knight c6, I don't know, because um, he's going to play d5. 
and then he has a kind of space advantage. Probably that should be okay for me. He has queenside space advantage after knight c6, d5, knight e7. Not really sure what I do there. Don't like giving up the center here. Maybe rook f8 with the idea of f5 at some point in the distant future. Get that rook to its true castled position. Maybe I should have castled earlier. It would have saved me a tempo. Um, okay, now rook d1 castles queen side. Oh, that changes everything. I did not anticipate this. We have queen g5 check for whatever that's worth. Queen h4. I've got to watch c7. He has knight b5 all the time. <clears throat> so my, my queen needs to stay around c7. Or something needs to protect c7. Actually, I could play, I could play rook e7 later on. Um, queen g5 check, king b1, queen h4. Queen h4 could get greedy, like queen h4, g3, queen takes h2. Do I want to take a pawn over there? Maybe I, maybe I should play f5. It's a little bit weakening. All right, let's go for it. We need to do something. I mean, yes, it's my king is a little open there, but he's got this bishop on h1. We beat him to the punch in the center. Hopefully, we're not worse. And that file. That's why I played rook f8. That's, that's the problem, though. The g3 is a good move. That is a problem. Hmm. Mm, mm, mm. That's not really what I was hoping for. Simple and good. G3. Now F4, keeping it closed. How long can I keep it closed, ultimately, if I play F4? This is kind of irritating. Um, man, that brings his bishop to life. I have to play F4 to kill his bishop. But that takes all the pressure off his center and leads to a really, really closed center. <laughs> we don't have any counterplay against the, the king's side or whatever you want to call it over here. Our position is like a king's Indian where we're geared to attack on the king's side. There's nothing to attack over there. And it's like, this is basically like a sameish king's Indian where white has more chances on the queen's side the black has chances on the king's side. If we talk about it in terms of classical queen side, king side, white seems better to me. He has more realistic um, chances on both sides of the board, actually. If I overextend myself, my king could become weak on that side. And he has less risk on the queen side, I think. Hard for me to start an attack against his king in this type of position. Not easy. Time seems, seems kind of short today. Yeah, we're down to just 30 minutes, and um, there's a couple other challengers. So I don't think we're going to play more than two more games. Tomorrow we'll be back with an unusual opening stream. On Wednesday, I play same time controls, but uh, we try to play different openings, unusual, unusual stuff, gambits, more fun openings. And, uh, you know, I'll play the King's Gambit with white, although I don't really know the theory that well and stuff like that. Okay, knight to d2, that looks like a bad move. Troll on a roll is, is kind of slow, so time tends to be his enemy, um, even more so than myself. He's left the center, and that means that, like, you know, something like taking on d4 might be much more realistic than it was a moment ago. Although I give up, I give up my center a little bit, he's given up control. He doesn't have knight takes d4. Maybe I can trade queens. And this end game is not uh, not so bad for black. You can play knight c6. Control e5. This is b7 is protected. 
I can protect um, c7 with like rook e7 if necessary. Famous last words. We might open up the F file. We open up the F file, we get a rook on the seventh rank, something like that. That'll be good. We're taking on G3 and entering down here on F2. So he has some counterplay with knight B5. I'll probably protect my C7 pawn, jettison the A7 pawn. Unless I find something tactical. Troll's just too slow. I think he's only a tiny bit worse here. He lost on time. I mean, let's see. Yeah, the computer says it's basically equal. F3. But I thought you were better until you played 92. You know, if we go back here a minute. Yeah, it's 0.6 advantage for white. I'm surprised by D takes E5, but there might be something tactically there. You're better here until you play knight d2. Apparently I missed something. I missed I missed the tactic. F takes e4 and d5. Oh. All right, this this was not not picked up by me. My radar you know, cuz f2 is hanging. I should have thought of that. Yeah, I should just take on e4. All right. That was a kind of bad a bad move by both of us. Seder needs to challenge to 8 plus 3. 8 plus 1, the increment's too small. Seder, I didn't notice this earlier, but you're, you're just challenging me to 8 plus 1, and we need like at least a, a 3 second increment. I'm going to play Mule Skinner in the interim. And I don't know if this will be the last game. I mean, we might be able to get one more in. But Seder, it's 8 plus 3. We need at least a 3, uh, three second increment. Mule Skinner, last time I got him in a... Oh, he may have changed his repertoire or something, I don't know. So, let's see, what was he playing before the Banco? But, I mean, this is not a good move order for a Banco player to play d5. Let's play g3. Last time he played, um, I played d4, he played, like, c5, I think. We went into a Queen's Gambit accepted, which was good for me. But rather than play the same thing as yesterday, I, I want to try, you know, to get something different. So, for everybody's benefit, call 911. A plus one challenge, not enough increment. Key dang, yeah, maybe tomorrow. We tend to get quite a few challenges, so there's kind of a queue. Not, not overwhelmingly so today, but just enough challenges to last us till till 12.30 when I have to I have to end the stream. Guys, I want to thank those of you who have donated via PayPal. We've had a number of, of people make donations to help support the YouTube channel and, and the stream here, and I appreciate it. Um, I also want to thank Thibault. The other day, um, one of the creators of Lee Chess, Thibault, uh, made a suggestion on my YouTube channel that I update my Firefox because I, I was using an old Firefox and my analysis engine wasn't really working um, as fast as it could. So if any of you guys are using Firefox, uh, you should make sure you have the, the latest Firefox if you're using it in conjunction with the uh, with the Lee Chess Stockfish engine to analyze games. Although I guess technically it's better to use Google Chrome for uh, for analyzing games here in within the browser. But um, that was nice of him to make a suggestion which seems to have improved my engine a lot. Um, when I was analyzing games yesterday after upgrading Firefox, it's uh, immediately I noticed that uh, not only is it faster, but it seems stronger. Um, the Stockfish engine that's analyzing, I could really tell like very quickly. All right, Mule Skinner playing um, Catalan, basically the black side, ready, ready, ready or Catalan, Hungarian master, ready Ricard. Have you ever had a chess 960 that put all the pieces where they belong? Um, I don't think so. I've never had that happen. But the odds are there that it can happen. It's easier than hitting a royal flush. 
in poker. Um, let's see, castles. So here, I think I was talking about this with someone recently, you know, alternatives to going into the Catalan. We can play like queen c2. I don't really like c takes d. I think that's a strategic mistake in this position. Um, b3 is the reti. I was just talking about reti Ricard, the famous Hungarian master. But let's go Catalan. Because I don't know how much Mule Skinner really knows. You know, he was playing the Benko. And it seems like maybe this is an older repertoire or something, but the Benko is a far cry from the black side of the Catalan. Um, basically, solid but a little bit passive. The black side of Queen's Gambit decline and, and the black side of this Catalan. You know, I think a player who played the Benko might be more uncomfortable here. Mule Skinner usually likes kind of closed positions, though, so I guess in, in the end, like, playing d4, d5 might be better for him strategically than than playing the Benko. I always thought it was kind of weird that he played the Benko, being a closed game specialist, let's call it. Um, so d takes c4. The main line is queen c2, which is basically played, played to death. a4 is trendy, has been trendy lately. But there are other moves for white, knight a3, um, maybe knight e5. I haven't played a proper Catalan in, in ages, and I never really knew the theory that deeply. But I, I feel like the Catalan is an opening where it's very logical, and uh, you, you can find the moves by process of elimination. Um, okay, knight bd7, whoops. Almost clicked on something by accident. So this move is taking me out of book. A6 is pretty universal. Universally played. B6 I, I also played. It's a interesting novelty played by one Russian GM in a number of games. I've even tried it with black. A6 is the main move, but knight bd7 is pretty rare. I mean, I would think we're just grabbing this pawn and slightly better. Maybe he can play a delayed a6. I'm not sure what difference it makes, objectively. It's an interesting question, and I'm not really an expert on the white side of the Catalan, but delayed a6 might allow bishop f4. That'd be my first idea, I don't know, you know. Of course, even there he has knight d5. It's a complicated game. Basically, white strategy in the Catalan is to try to kind of get play along the c-file, try to inhibit black from playing c5 if possible, and, and also try to use the long diagonal for the bishop on g2 in the open Catalan. I think um, it's more solid to play the closed Catalan with black, c6, um, or knight bd7. Closed Catalan lines, not everybody likes it, but it's it's a little more solid for black, I think, than the open. Mikey Slice is is hosting us. Kidang says, how often do we stream? Monday to Friday, 10 to 12.30 CET, as well as Sundays, Central European time. I do a simul on Lee Chess, typically at 6.30 p.m., for 20 to 25 players every Sunday. Um, that's in the evening. Most of my my weekday streams are in the morning, and um, Saturday is my day off. Basically, six streams a week, usually. A5 now. A5 is kind of a weird move. I mean, what's he trying to do? Play like B6 and Bishop A6, or what? what is this about? What is A5 about here? It's a difficult move to understand. I, I don't understand what a5 does. You're trying to stop b4. Just rook a6 is that? That's not a move, is it? A5 could be played, but very strange. So we have bishop f4. Maybe he's hoping for a b3 and playing a4 or something. I don't know what he's doing. So bishop f4. 
is one idea. Rook d1, kind of classic, classic restricting move. I mean, I'm just trying to like discourage him from playing c5 by playing rook d1. I'm not certain it's the best move. I had a lot of moves. I mean, bishop f4. One trick on the white side of the Catalan, and kind of similar to the Queen's Indian in a way, is like this knight on b1. I often don't know where to go with that piece. He's playing a5, a4. That is really weird. But I guess consistent, he's just kind of restricting me spatially, stopping me from playing b3 for whatever that's worth seems really bizarre all right bishop f4 i don't know what to do bishop f4 we need a plan um this is making me a little uncomfortable honestly this a5 a4 what a strange idea We have to play a3 at some point. I don't know. Let's play bishop f4. See how he responds to this. There's two moves for black. Actually, three moves for black here. I don't mind giving up my, my bad bishop for a knight, you know. So if he does something like knight to d5, I don't mind. And typically, Catalan players allow knight takes f4 in these kind of positions. I don't want my queen to get trapped. So I'm going to come back. He's got a problem with his bishop on c8. That is evident. Yeah, I'm, I'm liking e4 here. you got to admit, and this, this actually looks pretty strong. It's very awkward for white, I mean black, um, what to do now. He doesn't have access to the d5 square. His knight really wants to go to d5 and b4 to hit my queen. No, I don't think this this looks right for black. Doesn't have a good square for the queen. He doesn't have a lot of space. He doesn't have this knight before. We have attacking plans with like h4, knight g5, e5 on the king side typically. But I think now Knight c3. Should I take time to play a3? Do I need to do that? Or should I just let him play a3? And live with the consequences? Good question. Maybe I should play a3. Not to let him get too much space. Before I do anything else. I'm afraid that's just like a lot of space for him. You know, a3, knight c3, a3, b3. He's getting in time pressure here. Bishop d7. All right. I'm going to go with it. Taking my chances here. Stopping a3. Grabbing a little bit of space of my own. Making sure this square doesn't become, you know, part of his sphere of influence. Um... I don't see anything real drawback wise uh, for for me playing a3 like how is he gonna is he gonna get a piece on b3 or something not really likely here this just looks good I try not to exchange too many pieces for white since I have a space advantage you know, this looks really good black's just super restricted there's one one thing to think about, maybe, you know, if I routinely play knight c3, 
watch for knight c4. No, I can always take on a4. That's another good point of a3 is that I like kind of fix that pawn. So when I play knight c3, that'll be a target. And he won't have anything like fancy with knight c4. He seems really unhappy here. Actually, that variation, well, rook a5 is a, is a very logical move. But I mean, where's it going, you know? Ultimately, like on h5, it's it's a target, it gets trapped. This rook, it's a nice idea, but I think it's, it's not really gonna work out for black. Okay, what do I do now? The plan I was talking about earlier with h4, h5 actually looks kind of interesting. Grabbing space on the king side and uh, starting some threats of like e5, knight g5. Neil Skinner is a French defense player and I've seen him do not all that much different stuff in the French with this a5, a4. Yeah, he's he's come to think of it, he's playing this like a French, basically. G5 is a concept here for him. So I, I don't want to see that. He gets some squares for his pieces, but at the cost of weakening his position a lot with F5. I'm not really sure what I should have done there. I mean, now, Knight D6, I didn't anticipate that. What is going on here? Knight d6 is a really strange move. Look, it's a very abstract style of chess that this guy plays. Rook a5, knight d6, f5. It's, it's so bizarre. Um, hard to get your head around this position, really. Wait has a massive space advantage. There's something like e5. It's also hard to make progress. And that's what I'm talking about by liking closed positions. This particular player is uh, is kind of specializing in closed positions. Bishop g5, I'm thinking trade the, the good bishop. Trade off his good bishop. But his rook is coordinating across the f5. That's insane, dude. I don't see anything for white here, special. Nothing special. There's a lot of moves. Bishop g5 takes on e4. His pieces are, are getting really good. All right, let's just take some space. Knight e8, wow, I expected knight f7 there. Seems like a strange, a strange choice. All right, let's trade the bad bishop. He's going into French mode. This is so insanely abstract. And very fast, too. I'm getting dizzy, like, looking at this position. This is starting to actually bother me. Um, I'm getting, like, physically dizzy. What, what a totally abstract way of playing chess for black here. Not bothered by this massive spatial disadvantage. Not bothered by the bad bishop. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, this is the right idea. He's coming out there, I know. But he dropped his rook. I don't even know if I'm better in the final position, honestly. I'm really not sure. Not the final position, but before the final position. Look, I mean, the computer is like, equal. <laughs> Rook b5, equal. How can it be equal? I mean, the position this complicated. It's almost impossible. It's equal. The 
damn, dude, you play some some hardcore closed positions. Um, okay, guys, five three from Kidang. Yeah, we're gonna play the five three. Kidang, it's um, it's a nice fast game. We have like five minutes left, so. Kidang said, "I like f5. I like f5 too. I mean, under the circumstances, it was the only move that gives him any counterplay, and it's a good move. But I, I started to get dizzy and like to play those kind of positions with so little time on the clock. It's it's very disturbing somehow. Bishop d3 from Kidang. Normally Kidang, I don't play people who have new accounts with no games." But I'm gonna make an exception. Um, I typically like only play people who have. Actually, why don't you have like provisional rating with only 12 games? Shouldn't it be provisional? 12 games is enough to not have a question mark next to it. All right, Kidang. I really thought you had more games. That's all right. It's the last game of the stream. It's rated. Oh no. All right. We don't take rated challenges. I forgot. Blue Crow, you let it slip through. I let it slip through. Kidang will probably be a GM. 12 games with a rated challenge. He plays Bishop D3. It's probably like a Fide Master or something. Oh well. Because I'm commentating during the games, I don't play. I'm at a handicap. You know, that's why we don't play rated games. It's a very subtle, subtle system for white. Bishop d3, bishop c2. Only masters really know this idea. The average player doesn't know about that. That's a highly sophisticated opening strategy. I'm probably lost already here. Ah, I think we're going to lose this. Maybe we have enough counterplay against e4. Bishop g5 is not what I expected. Need to play a6. But I mean, 2004 after 12 games, um, he's moving instantly. Very sophisticated setup with bishop d3, bishop c2, rated challenge. These are the games I usually lose. Rook d2 is kind of a strange move. Looks a little bit too, how to say, um, I don't know, a little bit too straightforward. Not really threatening anything. Used to play Ward against Knight F3. What is Ward? Oh, not Ward. You mean uh, now? I remember um, Mule Skinner. Not Ward. You played the uh, what's his name? Wade <laughs> Ward. Ward is uh, is an English GM. Um, different person. Oh, what's up here? Not really sure what I'm supposed to do in this exact position. I guess we'll make a typical hedgehog move. Rook F E eight, Rook C eight. What would, what would Mihai Suba do? I don't know. Um, it's much easier to play the black side of the hedgehog than the white side of the hedgehog in a blitz game. I'll say that much. That's my opinion, you know, my experience, because I play both sides of these kind of lines. Uh, typically, white takes a lot of space, has a lot of responsibility. It's like being a landowner. You know, when you take a lot of space, you own a lot of rental apartments. Um, you know, you, you make money, but you have to, like, spend a lot of time maintaining them. And uh, there's a lot of responsibility that goes along with playing the white side of 
of of a of a hippopotamus. I mean, or or what's it called, hedgehog, um, marazzi like this. There's a lot of responsibility for white. So now we have b5, the break, and it looks good. But obviously, um, you know, it doesn't win by force or anything. Just it's a good it's a good break giving us counterplay. Ivan Chucky spectating. Nice name. One of my favorite players. Um, I was a little bit worried about my move order in this game. I did I didn't really want to play the Sicilian, but um, he kind of confused me with Bishop D three. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do after that, or what the best standard approach is. So I went with C5. I was kind of worried when I played, you know, Bishop E7, and he plays D4. Queen takes D4. What? Queen takes D4. Sorry, I didn't mean to offer a take back. Um, here, I was a little bit worried that after Knight F6, um, we're going back here. He had Knight B5. But then I realized I can just castle, and um, I'm probably okay there. Knight takes d6, bishop takes, queen takes, knight takes e4. Not sure, though. I didn't really trust this. Bishop d3, he find, finds the move. It's it's like only move for white here. Um, but we still have some good ideas, hopefully. Knight b6 at some point is an idea. I don't think the d5 is going to work around here. Why don't I believe the d5 is going to work? Well, there's several problems. Kidang 2004, 12 games. No, guys, I ask that you have like 50 games and, uh, and unrated challenges. So, just so everybody knows in the future. Um, maybe I have 95? That's nothing special, though. 95, he just takes it, and I have double pawns. Not so great. Actually, his, his bishop on c4 would be really solid. Okay, we're happy to see this. I mean, I was worried about bishop takes. My plan was to play knight to b6. But... In retrospect, I wasn't sure what was going on after like e5 at the end of the day there. e5 takes, and like he might have knight takes e5 with some counterplay. But after b takes c, I mean, it seems like we've just got a slightly better position. I mean, there's nothing, nothing really major happening here anymore. I'm not even sure this is the right move, knight c5, but I'm getting in a little bit of time pressure. It might have been better to play it like I was thinking about, knight b6, some other move. Because knight c5 actually lessens my control of e5. But it should be fine. At least black isn't worse in this position. He has a static weakness on c4. Um... All of our pieces are working. I actually thought maybe this this retreat, this diagonal was was more natural for white, but it's probably not that big a deal. Now I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. Rook d8. Defending my pawn on d6 from attack. In case of bishop g3 or some other nasty move, I would um, I'd be happy with this position in a tournament game. Could probably torture white for a long time here. Yes, bishop there. Knight h5 is possible. Looks good.
or slightly better. I'm going to take this. Bishops tend to be overrated, but uh, that's a dangerous piece, putting pressure on my d6 pawn. So I'm, I'm happy to get, get rid of him. And then um, hopefully we can focus on on that c4 pawn as a weak point. Wow, bishop g5, knight g5. Whew, man, that's pretty aggressive. I guess we'll just play h6. Instantly, knight h3. Weird. All right, let's bring the knight back. Going after a pawn. This guy's pretty resourceful. Rook d1. I don't know. Knight take c4 is, is uh, going to clean up a pawn. F4 dropping a piece. And that was fortunate. All right, guys. We'll be back tomorrow. Um, weird Wednesday, unusual openings. And uh, 10 a.m. to 12.30 tomorrow. So thanks for playing today. Thanks, Blue Crow, for moderating. We, um, we don't know. I mean, the opening, I thought he was better, actually. I, I don't really trust my, my reaction there in a hedgehog. Uh, Bishop d3 is, is a pretty tricky move. Um, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do against that. My reaction here was c5. Simon Kim Williams versus James Plaskett, 1999. Yeah. So I don't know, guys. This this is a little bit passive for black. Bishop c2, knight f6. I don't know about this position. I didn't feel real comfortable here, but it does look like a kind of standard hedgehog after all. All right. So we'll be back tomorrow, and um, that's Weird Wednesday, Unusual Openings. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for those who have sponsored with uh, PayPal and made donations. Even just $5 a year makes a big difference. And uh, one final note, if anybody's interested in chess training or lessons, you can send me an email, videochesstrainer at gmail.com. I might have room for like one more student. If someone's interested in taking weekly lessons, let me know, we might be able to work something out. So once again, guys, thanks for joining me. Check out the YouTube channel, Video Chess Training on YouTube, and we'll be back tomorrow. Bye-bye.